Excellencies, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our second part of this event commemorating the International Day of Peace. My name is Peter Heider. I'm the chair of the NGO Committee on Peace here in the UN in Vienna. The topic which we choose for today is, as you see on the program, Peace Needs, Use and Media. This topic uh, developed during a phone call with Mrs. Helga Kerschbaum. She's here and somehow she had a good experience with the organization which this gentleman represents in summer during a, a conference and then while talking she said yeah we need more uh, somehow input through the media and also like uh, uh, some kind of uh, we need younger people I mean we are very uh, wide rent, even we are not so young, but we are not the future of this world, everyone, uh, and even we agree. So we thought, let's take a topic like media and use how they are so important for uh, the propagation of this idea of peace and also, as we heard before, this culture of peace philosophy which was formulated at the beginning of the new millennium by the UN and also by UNESCO. To start uh, the conference, I want to read a few words from the message given by the UN Secretary General. In that quote, our world needs peace. Peace is the ultimate goal for all humanity. And on this International Day of Peace reminds us the solutions are, uh, let us be reminded, the solutions are in our hands. Cultivating a culture of peace means replacing division, disempowerment and despair with justice, equality, and hope for all. It means focusing on preventing conflict, propelling the sustainable development goals, promoting human rights, and teaching all forms of discrimination and, and taking all forms of, of discrimination and hate to an end. This month's summit of the future, which is a big project of the UN, uh, just around the corner, is a vital opportunity to advance these aims. Let's size it. Together, let's lay the groundwork for peace. And let's nurture a culture where equality, peace, and justice thrive. So the first speaker, it's our great honor that uh, Mrs. Rebecca Jobin is among us. She's the Chief of Office of the United Nations Office of Disarmament Affairs in Vienna. So disarmament is one of the really big topics when we speak about peace building. Even most, many people think we don't have enough weapons in this world. I remember one time when the Pope said, I think enough bombs fell already on, on uh, Syria at a certain moment and we should rather pray and fast that this uh, kind of spirit of creating and promote, prolonging this suffering and all this uh, 
bad feelings which are created that we rather stop than, than promote them. So disarmament is a key issue, so I'm very happy that we have the chief of office of the United Nations Office of Disarmament Affairs in Vienna among us. Great, thank you so much, uh, Peter. It's uh, really an honor to be here. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends, um, very, very grateful for the NGO uh, Committee on Peace of Vienna um, for organizing this wonderful gathering, for organizing also the peace bell ceremony um, on this commemorative uh, moment of marking the International Day of Peace. And I'm really delighted uh, to be here. Uh, today's um, day is really an opportunity to highlight uh, and strengthen the ideals of peace. Um, I think uh, at least one of the speakers just now um, was either you, Peter, or, or Jean-Luc, who said uh, peace is more than the absence of conflict, and I could not agree more. It is obviously about uh, the presence of justice, equality, human rights, and among those also the elimination of weapons that threaten our shared future. Uh, coming on the heels of the horrors of World War II and the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the goals of peace and multilateral disarmament and arms limitation have been central to the United Nations um, since its very founding. And so my office, the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs here in Vienna, UNODA, is really honored to participate in this event and to shed a bit of light on the contribution of this armament to these global um, goals of peace and security and to the empowerment of young people. Um, our office works uh, on two fronts, for those of you who are maybe not as aware of our work. So on the one hand, we work to advance the elimination of weapons of mass destruction, and on the other hand, to ensure uh, the effective regulation of conventional arms and to mitigate the harm that such weapons can cause. And while the existential threat uh, that nuclear weapons in particular pose to people and planet, while those threats loom large, it is often firearms or other conventional weapons that are the biggest concern to many communities, whether that's guns in schools or gang violence or the contamination of land through landmines or unexploded ordnance of war. And there is no doubt, Peter, you, you mentioned it, uh, and also when you quoted the Secretary General's message for this International Day, we are definitely living in challenging times and difficult times for the pursuit of peace. And when I look at the disarmament realm, um, it really hasn't been since the deaths of the Cold War that the risk of a nuclear weapon being used has been as high as it is now. Uh, global military spending hit an all-time high of 2.4 trillion US dollars last year, and at the same time, advances in science and technology are challenging international governance uh, and regulation and underscoring how urgent and important it really is for multilateral legal, normative, and policy frameworks to be fit for purpose. And no one leader, no one country, no one organization can solve these challenges on their own. This is why broad stakeholder groups, including civil society and young people, are so critical. So I applaud the NGO Committee on Peace for convening this broad stakeholder group and also for putting youth and the media at the center of today's event. Youth voices underpinned by their unique energy, creativity, and above all commitment to a better, more sustainable world are of vital importance in our common future. Uh, the Secretary General in his new, dis uh, new Agenda for Disarmament, which was published last year, and also an input to the Summit of the Future taking place this week that Peter just mentioned, um, he underscored the essential, powerful role of youth in allowing to, quote, identifying new solu solutions that will secure the breakthroughs that our world urgently needs. Their active participation in decision-making processes enhances the legitimacy of peace and security initiatives. And this is precisely why my office devotes significant attention to educating and empowering youth. Through our disarmament education work, as well as our Youth for Disarmament Initiative and targeted capacity building initiatives. Disarmament is often perceived as a highly technical or niche issue, which can deter people, especially young people, from feeling that there's scope for them to have an impact. Still, uh, I personally am convinced that there is much that the general public and young people, and of course the media in particular, can do to, to advance disarmament goals. 
In Vienna, um, my office here at ODA actively engages with students and the Viennese public through education and outreach efforts, where we enthusiastically also partner with, with local organizations. I think demystifying disarmament and highlighting its relevance for other agendas, whether it's human rights, uh, environmental protection, sustainable development, etc., is a key part of this. Weapons are very often connected to human rights violations and gender-based violence. Nuclear, but also conventional weapons, can leave devastating and long-lasting impacts on health and the environment. And soaring military spending and armed conflict can be impediments to achieving the sustainable development goals. So helping people to understand these connections and providing objective, factual, and impartial information about disarmament issues is an important foundation, especially in times of disinformation and misinformation. This is why my office invests heavily in creating publicly available tools and learning resources for lay audiences on different disarmament topics, making them available online, among other through our free e-learning platform, the Disarmament Education Dashboard. And taking disarmament from the abstract to the concrete is also crucial. And I believe the media is an important player in this regard, bringing to light issues in a compelling and fact-based way. So by building bridges between people and increasing knowledge on complex issues and motivating action, the media can serve as a partner towards disarmament and as a multiplier effect. Storytelling by and through the eyes of people affected by weapons can also be immensely powerful and inspiring action. This is why working with survivor communities is a key part of our work, including our youth programs. Just a few weeks ago, actually, 50 young leaders uh, were in Japan as part of our office's Japan-funded uh, Youth Leader Fund for World Without Nuclear Weapons. Um, there, they engaged with atomic bomb survivors and their descendants and local youth. And they articulated concrete commitments and actions that they as individuals can take to preserve the lessons of the past and work towards a more peaceful future. Our various youth fellowships and capacity building initiatives include young people from all across the globe and many walks of life, from political science to engineering, journalism to health sector and filmmaking to philanthropy. So in short, you do not have to be a disarmament geek, if you will, to be an advocate for disarmament and to share your vision for peace. UNODA regularly organizes competitions and social media campaigns for young people to express themselves creatively whether through music, poetry, film, art, or otherwise. And giving young people visibility, space, and an active voice in multilateral disarmament processes is also key to our work. Just last summer, uh, 10 of our youth leaders were in this very building, possibly this very conference room, I don't remember exactly, um, engaging with senior uh, policymakers and sharing their recommendations um, regarding the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And we were very lucky to have Marvin, who was sitting also on this panel, as part of that discussion. And only last week, the winners of our Sci-Fi Youth Storytelling Challenge uh, spoke at a major international conference in Seoul about their creative visions of a year 2145 and the positive impact, of, uh, uh, positive and negative impact of artificial intelligence. So these are just a few examples of the way we look to bring young and diverse perspectives into disarmament and inspire action for peace. My important message for you all today, whether young or not so young, young at heart, I like to say, um, would be not to be discouraged. Um, each and every one of us has agency and can play a part in achieving a more peaceful world. Start by informing yourself. Our online educational and learning offerings are a good start, but so too are credible media outlets and news sources. Engage your immediate community, whether at home, at school, university, or otherwise. Organize a film screening, a discussion, or set up a club or network um, with other interested people. Make yourself heard by participating in events like this, by writing to your elected officials, or contributing to creative campaigns. So I want uh, you to, to, to walk away from this meeting also um, recognizing that disarmament is not a utopian ideal. It is a key security instrument and a contributor to preventing and resolving conflict and to alleviating human suffering. We need collective action to make it a reality. So let's take this opportunity today to recommit ourselves to lasting peace and to recognize the crucial role of young people in the media in this regard. Let's cultivate a culture of peace together.
So I thank you and I look forward to a vibrant discussion with all of you today. Thank you. with education, 
information and being picked up by positive role models. The roles. The roles of hope, peace, and human beings. Part two. My attempt at an explanation. My secrets are communication, dialogue, information, and education. So these three areas can be very fine tools to create a good media world for young people and finally for all ages. I have found this well-known little sentence in a well-known magazine in Austria last Tuesday. Here, Peter told before in front of the peace bell, uh, do not mention weapons. But I do it now because here you can read, words can be weapons, very dangerous weapons. And that is true, just words. But words can be also a rocket to explore, to explore the sky of peace, maybe. A base for mindfulness and appreciation, peaceful words. And I have found also a headline in the same magazine titled School is the place where the future of a society will be decided. A very important sentence. Three months ago I attended at an event at the Houses of Parliament here in Vienna. The general topic was Are social medias the big danger for democracy? And the unique answer was, yes, it's a big danger. But there was also a, a solution, a key for this problem, media literacy. Beginning with the young ones, part three of my speech, my visions and my missions. As I told you before, I want to be a storyteller, a storyteller for the good. I want to build bridges with a little help of pictures, of stories, of people, of role models, and the confession, I'm not perfect, but maybe you have the power to do it better than me. Is this okay, Vincent, for you? Okay, of course. My wife is a clinical psychologist, and many kids have the same problem, to be bad influenced and to be alone. My vision is based on a big hope that we all can build a taxi service, an individual service for presenting our children and our generation a new sign, a sign of positive actions. Part four. My best practice models for creating such positive actions. First of all, the Flame of Peace, a worldwide peace mission created by Hertha Margarete habsburg Lothringen. More information you will find on the Flames website. The second best practice models, 950 kilometers from Admont to Rome. Yesterday, there was a unique event in Styria at the monastery of Atmont. 650 children were running together the whole distance, 950 kilometers, to Rome. They all want to show Viribus Omitis, you can reach a big goal with the power of a community. And also in the running position were teachers, priests and monks, mayors, directors, and many more role models. The third best practice model is Mama and Papa Europe. On the 3rd of October this year at the European Experience Center in Vienna, painters, authors, artists, musicians from over than 17 countries, different countries, show the power of culture with help by the power of media, with the power for peace. A sign to Europe, a little sign And we in the Austrian club of journalists 
we're gonna do a big thing. It's called the Academy for Young Journalists from eight up to 16 years. This academy will start next year. It's a mission and we want to show kids and young people how to report, how to create and live stories, how to feed the profession and passion of a journalist. What is truth? How to experience the feeling for life together with the journalistic code of honor and the support of role models, parents, teachers, specialists, journalists, and people on streets. <coughs> Next best president, uh, practice model, label serious play. This program is absolutely fantastic. I did it years ago, and I will always remember the power of constructing, creating solutions, gaming in many areas of life. Dr. Brigitte Schwarzer is a guest. She's here and will be open for every information you need. Lego series play, it's wonderful. And everybody loves to play, every age. And last but not least, I'm very proud to be a part of this, are the journalists for peace. We have so many journalists and reporters from war, but we haven't enough journalists for reporting peace worldwide. And so, it's our youngest baby, in very close cooperation with the Austrian Journalist Club. There will be also an uh, online course next year for this program. And all the information concerning the Journalists for Peace, you will get directly by the founders that are sitting here in front, uh, Barbara and Johannes Meister, and I'm very proud of it for this program running next year. The fifth part of my speech, my pictures, part two. Oh, I'm gonna look with the, oh, you have it. Oh, here is it. Oh, thank you very much, Sam. This is a little brain of a young kid, and I'm gonna fill it with my breathing air. <coughs> it's a big brain, it's young. So, this one is part of the cactus kit. You know what happens? When there is the wrong information to the brain of a young kid, a young cactus, when they come in contact, what happens? <laughs> this one. And they have another brain in my pocket. Vincent, you have stolen that? Oh, no. It's a good guy, thank you. So, this one. Oh, it was much too much. I'm so sorry about that. They haven't known my balloon. But I, want, I want to show you, but they're very old ones. I want to show you how it is when a balloon comes in contact with the bloom of a rose. The brain is still. Okay. So this was my last picture here. Uh, I think no more words to say. And the last one is my way of saying, I'm sorry. Thank you so much, little cactus and little rose, that you are here. And I'm so sorry, little cactus kid, that I've used your body, your things, as an example picture. Sorry, please forgive me. And thank you very much, little rose, for being the positive example. And the listeners, if you want more information concerning my visions, my missions, and my work, don't hesitate to contact me. You will find my business cards here in front, and please write me. I want to write you back as soon as possible. This presentation was built by my own, with no support of artificial intelligence. <laughs> but with the help by my heart intelligence. Thank you all for coming, for listening to my words, seeing my pictures, and feeling my heart beating. Thank you. The next speaker comes again from the house here. Uh, it's uh, Mrs. Iris de Rancier. She works in the United Nations office on drug and crime, 
and she is now with strategic planning and the interagency and the interagency affairs unit and she also has a lot of experience in uh, dealing with young people and her motto is use as agents of change to achieve the SDGs. Super. Thank you so much, Peter, and thank you all for being here. Uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's truly a pleasure to speak about and for peace, advocating for it. And I would like to thank the NGO Committee on Peace in Vienna for their, the existence of this event. It's so important to see people from so many different backgrounds, so many different places here, to have these discussions and really dive into what does it mean to advocate for peace. Uh, so I do indeed work for the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, and unfortunately, I do not have as many props as the previous presenter today. Um, and our mandates are intrinsically linked to building peace by making the world safer from drugs, crime, terrorism, and corruption. Uh, and what you might think of when you think of these mandate areas is, unfortunately, and the story told in the media today, is that youth and young people are often the culprit. And I want to sit here and say, this is, <laughs> you know, Young people are advocating and moving for peace in their communities, and I think we need to change the story. Uh, so often when I speak with law enforcement, when we speak with people in their communities, there's this um, embedded kind of sense that young people are the ones who are doing these things, and I think we need to re rearrange this thought process, and, and youth are the ones advocating in their communities. Uh, this story does not always match the reality. It's important to acknowledge the role that youth play. First of all, there are more youth in the Global South in particular than ever before. We're seeing a large youth bulge in many places across Asia and Africa, and this is changing the demographics, it's changing how we need to interact with our society, it's changing the politics itself. Uh, additionally, youth are acting as instigators of change, not only in the future, but also now. So often the rhetoric is around youth are the future, and that is very true. Uh, and they're also impacting their communities now, and we have examples of that just from some of the panel members here. And thirdly, I would also mention that youth are peace builders and promoters of nonviolence in their communities, as we have a variety of examples from our work here at UNODC. Uh, this work is also not only associated with our office, but with the larger youth peace and security agenda as a whole. Uh, and maybe some of you are familiar with the women peace and security agenda, and perhaps you've never heard of the youth peace. This agenda was put forward by Security Council Resolution uh, 2250 in 2015, along with other Security Council resolutions, including um, 24, uh, 2419 and 2535, and which really promotes the idea that young people are essential to conflict prevention and peace building and need to be part of the process of integrating and building peace. Young people often face barriers to interacting in spaces of peace building and formal negotiations. From the lack of representation that they face in these areas, including in political participation, to societal discrimination, uh, they are not, even though they may be the largest demographic in a conflict setting, they are often the ones who are left out of the loop. UNODC is working with state actors around the world, and we're also trying to make sure that there's spaces for young people to advocate for peace. Uh, one example of this is in a recently launched uh, network of 32 youth peace champions in Nigeria. This is building off of a project that we previously did with Strive Juvenile, where we worked with young people to build their resilience and also asked them to work with children in their communities to prevent radicalization in the northeastern corner of Nigeria in the Borno province. This is in, in, in really important not only to have young people working with other young people but also to make sure that they're acting as agents of change in their own right, uh, out of, with their own voices. UNODC's work here is not only connected to the youth peace and security agenda, but also the sustainable development goals and a larger agenda, uh, agenda uh, for sustainable development. In particular, we work with a lot of different sustainable development goals, but particularly SDG 16. This emphasizes peace, justice, and strong institutions. In particular, there are not only these larger goals, but we have targets of these goals. One of them being 16.1, which asks to significantly reduce all forms of violence 
and related death everywhere. These, these processes are linked to conflict prevention, but also violence prevention at large. Uh, often we talk about conflict and the absence of conflict is peace, but often um, there are violence that is perpetuated by organized crime and other forms of criminality, which impede peace at large. We recently published a study at UNODC, the Global Study on Homicide, which highlights the fact that many people globally have died, not only from uh, conflict-related deaths, but also homicide. Uh, and on top of that, this summer, uh, my team published a youth fact sheet, which extrapolated all of the data related to homicide and added elements related to youth. So it's a much easier user-friendly version for everyone. Uh, not only does it include important insights, but it also includes uh, important voices. We conducted an interview of young women who are directly impacted by gang violence to hear their stories and to understand what they've lived through, the types of migration practices they've had to go through, and the, uh, their work to get an education is truly inspirational. I think often we hear these big statistics, but we forget the fact that there's people and places of that face them and have to go through these lived experiences. When we just hear the facts, sometimes we move ourselves from this and that's not what's needed. Instead, we need to see the faces behind these statistics. And one of these statistics is that from 2019 to 2021, there's approximately 440,000 people killed in homicide, or at least that's what was reported. And in fact, this is 20 times more than the total deaths reported by terrorism and four times more than the deaths reported by homicide. So when we're looking at these staggering numbers, we also have to imagine the families, the individuals, and the people who are impacted. And it should also be noted that these uh, you know, staff on homicide are largely Asian youth, especially when you look at the Latin America and the Caribbean and other regions which are astronomically impacted by these deaths. So when it comes to ending violence and promoting peace, we need to take efforts to reduce violence and conflict but we also need to take efforts to reduce uh, organized crime and other forms of criminality where it runs our country. In order to do this, there are things we can do here in this room, and I, I think it's important to act on that. We can always ask and advocate for youth to be more present in decision-making processes, policy frameworks at all levels. Uh, this includes having panels and sometimes ad hoc events where young people are present, but also making sure that they're part of decision-making. We can also encourage government civil society organizations like yourselves and international bodies to invest in youth-led initiatives and promote peace and sustainable development. I was in a meeting recently on the Youth Peace and Security Agenda, and they said that the average youth organization runs on a grant of about 5,000 US dollars a year. So that's not a lot of money, but it also means it's a long way that they can go acting on the ground at a grassroots level to promote peace. And this is something that we need at that at an overarching level. And then thirdly, I think we might think, okay, you know, we're based here in Austria, maybe you join us from somewhere else, or maybe you do live there yourself. We don't face a lot of conflict in our day to day. But as was advocated for before, we need to do things on a personal level to make sure that we're advocating for peace. Whether it's addressing climate change, uh, advocating in your schools or in your workplace, or working towards one of the sustainable development goals. These are all things that we can do to promote peace on a daily basis. I would just like to conclude by saying young people are not just beneficiaries of the sustainable development goals, but they're also key drivers of their success. Nowhere is this more evident than SDG 16 on promoting peace, justice, and strong institutions. Youth have the energy, creativity, and resilience to challenge status quo, and they are already leading efforts to build peaceful communities, peaceful communities, sorry, demand justice, and promote transparent institutions. They're only their potential can only be fully realized when they are meaningfully included in decision-making processes. Let us recognize young people not just as the leaders of tomorrow, but as the change makers of today. Thank you very much.
sighs or thoughts the atomic bomb which affected their life. And uh, there's like some, some uh, belief that if you fold a thousand grains, then your health will come back. So she started to fold grains. Unfortunately, she didn't recover, but uh, the effort goes for the result. So please take these grains home with you to remind you a whole year until we meet next time for International Day of Peace, that peace, somebody is investing that we can all live in peace. The next speaker. The next speaker is Mr. Marvin Huber. And uh, it's very encouraging to see that Austria has, since a few years, always a UN youth delegate. And he was the previous one, I think it's only a youth delegate for two years, if I'm rightly informed. And uh, he will tell us something about the idea behind this project of UN Youth Delegates, and of course we will say something why youth is important for peace. Microphone, yeah. Thank you, that helps. Um, I was not planning to speak too much about the UN Youth Delegate Tenure because unfortunately it has come to a close. But I was um, planning to speak about uh, what is really at the center and has been at the center of my work for these two years. And this was, um, and I think will always be in my life, to think of youth, uh, peace, and security as a common together issue. For this uh, International Day of Peace, I was given the great honor uh, to share my truth about the state of our world and where we are heading. And I believe the following is the truth for many of us young people. Young people get told to dream big, while the present is so unfathomably broken that we don't dare to. Young people get told to trust our values, uphold morals, and have open beliefs, whilst in our world the rule of law is disregarded for the power of the strong. Young people get praised as the leaders of the future, whilst no one is even capable of steering, steering in our present. And with this I ask you, is it any wonder that young people are getting angry, frustrated, and lose trust in our institutions? I don't think so. But it's important what young people do with these frustrations. Young people turn them into action. And in my work throughout civil society, I had the greatest pleasure to meet hundreds of brilliant youth who are ready to walk the talk and push policy forward. Youth who organized aid for crisis areas, youth who protested government's foreign policy, and youth involved in groundbreaking peace work. For me, one thing then directly became imperative, and that is peace desperately needs you. Peace needs youth as 50% of our global population is under 30, but not just as a demographic necessity, but a democratic imperative, and as a fundamental avenue for account the accountability of institutions, their mandates, their legal norms, and to make sure they are really serving the people they're trying to serve. As the biggest group of users of technologies at the center of new and rising security challenges, may this be artificial intelligence, vehicle automatic weapon systems, or hydrocarbon warfare in the digital world. Peace needs you as multipliers of peace building work, extending their reach, impact, sustainability, and effectiveness. Peace needs you as a generation understanding that without peace, there is no future, but peace alone cannot be eaten. You need more than that. You need to understand the intersectionality, intersectionality of human rights, peace, and sustainable development. And peace desperately needs you as a group which is ready to break the paradox that in many parts of our world they are seen as a democratic majority, but feel like an excluded minority. Excellencies, now I'm soon to be. I am a 
favorite quote in peace uh, of Nobel Peace Prize laureate Sergei Williams. But whilst I would have not put it that drastically, I want to share it with you. The image of peace with a dove flying over a rainbow and people holding hands singing Kumbaya ends up infantilizing people who believe that the same peace is possible. If you think singing and looking at a rainbow would suddenly make peace appear, then we are not understanding the difficulties of our world. Thus, I want to share my view of what fighting for peace nowadays looks like in these challenging times. Fighting for peace means that all parties to conflict need to comply with international humanitarian law, international human rights law, and do this in all conflicts of our world. We need to defend the victims, fight aggressors, and realize that the end cannot justify the means. It is not clear which parties in conflict do their best to adhere to these standards and minimize human suffering, and which don't. Fighting for peace nowadays means that nothing may bring us to deviate from applying these standards of international law to ourselves in all our acts, the Charter, the Geneva Conventions, and our ethical understandings must guide us. And fighting for peace must mean that we need to stay vigilant and enforce these standards. We must not turn neutral or accept the increasing severity of our world, world's crisis, but actively seek remedy and help the suffering on the ground while we are providing people safe havens. And for me, the following is the most fundamental. We may not just simply hope for peace or hide behind difficult debates if we are amongst the ones so privileged as not to have to experience war. We need to work for peace. As with this, we have a world to win. And I shared, uh, I shared a quote earlier of Jody Williams who did this exactly. With the United Nations, the International Committee of the Red Cross and youth organization together, they created the international campaign to ban landmines. And they lobbied over two-thirds of all countries in the world to join this convention. Over 150 states stood, and they severely limited the production, the supply, um, and uh, the transport of arms and personnel. This not only meant that people who suffered from these uh, were finally given um, assistance, but 40 million stockpiled mines were actually uh, depleted. Our world is full of these success stories, and you were always or often at the center of it, but, nearly, uh, but uh, get near attention. And an event which is currently going on, and has been mentioned two times, is also something that I want to put at the center, the so-called summit of the future. And the most fundamental question I think all of us have to consider when talking about peace is the reform of the UN Security Council. For the first time in my life, and some guy called Antonio Guterres says, uh, for the for the greatest um, time in this generation, Security Council reform has taken place or will take place with the so-called Pact of our future. Finally, there will be a process, hopefully, leading to a reform. And finally, there are some uh, steps taken to now already realize changes in the Security Council, which can be done without having to adapt the Charter of the United Nations. All of this is absolutely substantial because the misuse of the veto which we all know has unfortunately blocked the United Nations system. Whilst all of this seems reassuring, we unfortunately also have to realize that these took two young, long years of negotiations and also took, um, and unfortunately this pact has not delivered on all fronts, such as nuclear disarmament or the need of automatic weapon systems. But it also shows that if we work for peace, we will succeed. And thus I call on all of us to not lose sight of the crisis, to not accept them, and to not lose our philanthropy with the people affected, to never forget our own privilege, not being in situations of war, to trust that with hard work we can change these terrible situations, to put this hard work into action, and to finally realize that we need each other in this process, meaning we need peace, youth, and media. Thank you. I have one question. Can you tell us the best experience or the most memorable uh, experience you had being a youth delegate? Uh, because you attended uh, uh, certain conferences, means you met certain unusual people. Uh, what uh, was your best experience or your worst or something you can never forget? from these two years. <laughs> Incredibly badly. Uh, thank you so much for the question, Larry. 
Uh, sorry for messing up the format. But, uh, uh, but I believe uh, the most important thing of being a human user delegate is that you take inputs forward. So um, in the best case scenario, you wouldn't exist. It would be a system where young people can directly talk to the policy makers. Uh, and uh, what we had the pleasure to do was to travel around Austria and all of Europe to see and seek young people's ideas, visions, and um, their demands for a, a, a future being sustainable and peaceful. And I was able to take them forward. I was able to address the third committee, and I was able to work together with brilliant uh, people in the United Nations systems, which do their best to get young people involved. And uh, with this, I think I was able to have four words in a UN uh, resolution um, uh, naming um, that uh, young people should be given adequate space in the uh, coming of the future. So it's a hard, hard uh, work, two years of lobbying, uh, of meeting young people to only get some phrases in the UN resolution. But in the end, it's way more about these direct connections. It's way more about making sure that um, young people feel heard and in the end, they, they get back uh, what they have given to the process. Uh, thank you. <laughs> But one final invitation, I know this event uh, closes at 5, and um, afterwards I will be heading to the climate strike from Fridays for Future. If anyone wants to join me, you're uh, openly welcome, and uh, we can meet wherever. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> knew her father quite well and I always appreciated him even I never understood him but I felt he's such a good man yeah this was when I met him I was always impressed by his presence and uh, so I'm very happy to hear like because his daughter she keeps uh, uh, his uh, legacy and then she continues his work and so Anyway, and she does her own great things. So she will explain us now the colorful turn into a young communication with young people. Thank you, Peter Heider. Thank you, NGO Committee on Peace Vienna, for inviting me. Honestly, this title, I uh, just read it this morning. I prepared um, on why peace meets youth and <coughs> Believe it or not, before the year 2001, the year the General Assembly voted to designate this day, the 21st of September, as one of non-violence and ceasefire, I wrote a text as follows. Today is the 21st of September. Year, well, I let you guess, 99. 3,659 and if it was year 3,659 would it matter? I don't like changes someone said today and believe me you wouldn't like that kind of change because quite big things have changed indeed world has changed Today, on the International Day of Peace 2024, I want to share the important idea with you why peace meets youth and media, children, and youth in general, challenge us adults in profound ways. First, they challenge us in our values. As adults, we may come to accept that as part of life, and war as part of our world. We might rationalize it as a natural process. Some might even say today it is part of God's plan. Our values, our beliefs, that everything happening in the world is part of some political, natural, or supernatural plan fall apart when confronted with the pain of children. 
as we see today in Gaza. Our convictions crumble in the face of children's suffering, whether it's in Gaza, in Ukraine, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, or elsewhere. Such suffering forces us to question our worldview. Second, children and youth corrupt us with their passion for life. Perhaps it's even their role, their task, to corrupt us with their passion and joy for life and their passion and joy for the living. While older generations have seen more of the world and become less enthusiastic about the future, young people still bring this excitement, even over something as simple as their next birthday. Their passion reminds us of the importance of life, pushing us to fight for peace, to seek solutions, and to find better tools and weapons than weapons are. Fighting for peace, not war or victory, requires weapons of a different kind, tools, means, and above all, commitment. I'm part of a team that runs the magazine Buntes AT. Buntes AT stands for <coughs> giving visibility to underrepresented topics, opinions, and people. The magazine grew out of the experiences of migration, what my father called from the womb of migration. When I took over editorial leadership of Buntes AT, formerly the Global Player, and before that, Die Bunte Zeitung, and the leadership of the organization Die Bunte in 2018, the first sentence I wrote in my mission statement was, everyone does what they think is right. Jeder und jede tut, was er oder sie für richtig hält. I believe it is right to tell you the truth. That is why I'm here, to tell you the truth. And the truth is, a few days ago, I received videos documenting an attempted prison break at Makala the largest prison in Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo on the September 1st. What was secretly filmed on a mobile phone and shared as far as Austria is tragic beyond words. Collapsed walls, the bodies of young men everywhere, desperate efforts to <laughs> rescue the buried, suddenly volleys of gunfire in the background. At least a hundred people must have died. This is not fake. This is not Hollywood, nor Netflix. This is the truth. There is no room in the Austrian mainstream media for the news that over a hundred people died during a recent outbreak in Kinshasa. For that, we have WhatsApp. Telegram, Rumble, you name it. Social media has become the primary source of information <coughs> for topics that don't make it into mainstream outlets. It is also the preferred source of news for young people. Nearly two thirds of youth today rely on social media for their daily news. Yet the Makala prison break found its way into Wikipedia. 2024, Makala prison breakout attempt. On September the 1st, 2024, an attempted prison break at Makala Central Prison in Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo, led to the deaths of at least 129 people. As both Congolese and a human being, I saw it as my duty to report to you about these young guys I saw in their last moments before death so that they are not forgotten. From the beginnings of the 
regulated censor press in Austria dating back to the year 1621 to today's free and independent media. The role of the press has been to serve as a court power. It's in its role as a watchdog, it is an essential part of building and sustaining peace. Many diverse media projects have contributed to this mission, ensuring a vibrant and independent press for the benefit of our society. Today, I carry a press card from the Austrian journalist club ÖJC, Austria's largest platform for media professionals. With around 2,600 members, it stands as the largest independent journalist organization in the country, serving as a hub for journalists and media professionals, both in Austria and internationally. The ÖJC also informs its members and the broader public via newsletter on relevant issues and events. It is through the ÖJC that I'm able to stand before you today on this International Day of Peace, September the 21st, 2024, to rally for peace. And yes, of course, today is actually September the 30th. Perhaps that only means we are ahead of our schedule. Thank you. <laughs> Good news that we are ahead of our schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can tell you tomorrow there will be also many events uh, in the city of Vienna. And then I will travel to the border of Austria, Czech Republic, and Germany, where a new peace road will be designated uh, anyway to the, from the border to a certain place uh, in Germany. So activities are going on and so even we are ahead of schedule. Tomorrow many other projects uh, will happen. So have a look at the white media, probably more in the social media than in the mainstream media and you can attend at least one is in, I think in the morning on Stephens from in the afternoon. I don't have it now with me, but at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock follows by a project to the for the peace. I, uh, so 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock. I will be there. Stephens <laughs> Platz Vienna. So our final speaker is Mr. Vincent Engrich. Actually, his organization created this event today, yeah? because Mrs. Uh, Kirschbaum, she met uh, Dave Koch, who, who, whom she invited, but he sent Mr. English from e EUTH, please explain us how to spell it properly, Association for the Promotion of individuality among young people in Europe. Sounds very uh, interesting. So please tell us more about uh, your project. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, your Excellencies, esteemed attendees, honorable guests, and most important, the Duke sitting in this room. First of all, it's pronounced EU, so a combination of European Union and you, um, just to get that right out of the way. Um, I know some of you have introduced your organizations, but you already know my name, and you already now know my organization's name. So today, I want to use this opportunity to tell you something, and together enjoy a enjoy some different thoughts and emotions. I want you to judge me and to judge this organization by what we're saying today here. Because exactly here in these halls, 
we must be aware of our future even more than we are aware of our past. Because nowadays, nobody is a dead about solidarity, just like the dead in the Mediterranean. That's the similarity. This was the first public sentence of me talking about the international topic. Five years ago in school, my friends and I got the chance to express our concerns and thoughts through a song. We thought this was a topic that was important back then for the upcoming 2019 EU elections. I was 15 years old and concerned. Concerned about global issues. Concerned about school performance, and yes, also concerned about love. To keep it simple, concerned about our future with me. In human history, young people always have been the most concerned. It's a no-brainer, since they are the ones most affected by every yet so small change. But not they are, we are. No matter our nationality, our ethnicity, our gender, our education, wealth, or social status, we are the most affected by it. The young people living and the young people soon to be living on this planet. Everyone wants and needs some peace in their life. I don't want to offend anyone sitting here but what I'm about to say, nevertheless, I probably will. The higher someone's status, the safer someone is from catastrophes, disasters and wars, and the extremer someone's detached from civil society, the less important gets peace, because it is replaced by a cobweb of security mechanisms. And those someones could be us sitting here today. But really, what is peace? And what does it mean? Not in a way a dictionary would define it, but in a way you would define it for yourself. What I think is peace is that it's a lot like democracy. You have to know you must work for it at all times, whether times are peaceful or not. Peace is only possible to be kept alive if we feel it with patience, solidarity, mindfulness and sometimes the right amount of indulgence. But that's just my experience. So I simply ask, I ask the people around me what mixture of words, emotions and images they experience while thinking about peace. And here's what they said. When I think of peace, I think of a place where you feel at home place where you can be yourself without the fear of being hurt by your surroundings. When I think of peace, I think of a strong European Union and a strong international community where compromises are taken to achieve the best for everyone and appreciation such as human dignity are untouchable. When I think of peace, I think of tolerance. But tolerance for whom? just our people. When I think of peace, I think of peaceful mess. But is being peaceful in the wrong moment still peace? When I think of peace, I think of the state that no one is aware of as long as it lasts, but that everyone wants if it is not there. But by looking at our world, and comparing these thoughts to what's going on out there, we might conclude that the situation we are currently in is a literal man-made fever. And I asked you, what happens to a fever? No matter if it is your body, this society, our world. At some point, we have to get rid of this sick situation. What I've heard a lot is that there are only two ways to get rid of it. The first one, die. The second one, kill the fever. But why? That's what everybody says, but why not get rid of the, get rid 
um, and why not go the third way and transform this this fever into a peaceful germ that is able to coexist. I've asked it before and I will ask it again. Really, what do I mean by peace? Do I mean inner peace? Do I mean a piece of bread, a piece of cake? Or do I mean something that's maybe a bit more like world peace? So, what we need for peace is, honestly, I don't know, I can tell you. Because it is what you take from this speech and define as peace and then as the necessary steps towards it. I just know that we have created a world where borders define who we are and how we live. So we need a piece of openness. We have created a world where greed and hate are our main drives. So we need a piece of kindness. We have created armies fighting for slavery. So we need a piece of liberty. We talk so much but feel so little. So we need a piece of love. We have created deeds but locked ourselves in. So we have a piece of freedom. We have created airplanes and mobile phones <coughs> bring us closer together, yet our minds are drifting further apart. So we have a piece of unity. We all want to live in a world where the young have a perspective and the old have security. So we need a piece of peace. And let me end the speech just as it began back in 19 with some lyrics of the song we wrote back then. I know we have moved away from the ideality. Unfortunately, we have forgotten how to stick together as our pursuits. It once started as a project for a new reality we only have now to rediscover these roots. Maybe 
three for staff and uh, uh, just there's a rule you can speak about everything but not over two minutes. <laughs> around the world on stage with artists from Finland, from Ukraine and from Russia. Why I do this? Because I want to show a sign on stage there is no war. And it's the power of theatre, of music I show. And my wife is a soprano too, like maybe, and we want to do more of that kind of polit uh, political signs in the world that arts, culture and traditions are very wonderful to be seen. Maybe it's not a political answer, but it's a kind of answer to me. So, the Journalist for Peace is a platform and as I mentioned, I want to show best practice models you can offer to us. Maybe tomorrow we have a dancing in white clothing. I'll be also there in front of St. Um, Stephen's Cathedral and uh, maybe we have some projects with, with music on this platform with uh, young people. I've given an invitation to write about a best practice model in their school or in their family. And they can be a little, little stories, very little ones. And Journalists for Peace is what it mentions, what it clears on that way to do some work, writing, reporting, creating stories concerning peace. But war exists. And when you spell the word war from the backwards to the beginning, it's raw. War is raw. And peace sounds very, very sweet. And this is the main goal of our new platform, Journalists for Peace, to bring people to us with their projects, with their events, with their opinions with their uh, invitations to act with the power of peace. I, sorry, I have, I have to say a big thank you because there are so many friends of mine here in the auditorium and I am very pleased about Suzuka Hirschman, uh, for example, and uh, for a very, very fine colleague, Dr. Peter Reinisch, and we talked about the, about the press media work here for the United Nations and so we are going to do maybe a little bit more for such a good event and uh, that would be great. Thank you Peter for being here. He's also in the leading board of the Austrian Journalist Club. Thank you. Thank you and uh, there was some I think the question was how social media could be used to have uh, more participation or to improve the participation. Uh, I think there have already been some years ago very good attempts in this direction through Liquid Democracy. These are technical tools, software that can be used. Um, the pirate party <laughs> more or less they advocated this. But um, I think also nowadays uh, new parties like for example the Beer Partei they also show new models of participation can be designed and modeled. So, uh, yeah, I think social media is definitely a tool. So it's only the question how we use it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, just in general, I would say peace for me always is justice. So what is, uh, I think, primarily important is to try to establish justice and um, which would be, for example, necessary is include 
the African continent much more than it is included nowadays could help and foster peace in yeah, this polarized world. I would like to say something to first uh, the question about uh, Russia and its uniform against this council. Um, first of all, I don't want to talk about especially war Russia and Ukraine because it's a very emotional topic right now. So I'm going to take it to a, a bit simple picture that everybody can relate. Um, the picture would be two children whose schools we all have been children. We all had our fights with our best friends and then we all probably didn't talk for three days. But only this fight came to an end when one of us was ready to talk. So I would never um, actively say that any country should be excluded from any kind of meeting because we need these rooms, we need this space to talk. And even if they don't talk, this space has to be there that in case they want to talk, they're able to talk. And that's what I think is crucial in any conflict, that we have these mm -hmm. imaginations, we have this yeah. location here in Vienna, we have to make room for um, parties of conflict to talk with each other, and that's our mission here. Mm -hmm. I wanted to just uh, make two comments, one on kind of technology in general, and also to echo um, what has been said already in terms of the immense opportunity, of course, that it uh, presents. And, and we, as I mentioned also in my short remarks, we do use social, social media a lot in our outreach activities with youth in particular, and bringing in creative, artistic challenges and means for people to express themselves and become engaged. So I think tapping into those opportunities and doing it in a way that's inclusive and global is very, very important. Of course, there are risks, and this is a big part of our job, I would say a growing part of our job in the UN Office for Strong Affairs, is dealing with the risks that technology also present. So te technology is definitely a double-edged sword, and for us, a big part of our work is making sure that necessary guardrails are also established to deal with those challenges and how that impacts on weapons and so forth. So I think there is work uh, for us on both sides in terms of using technology to democratize access to uh, information and decision-making power uh, of people, but also to make sure that the necessary guardrails are in place. Um, on the issue of uh, dialogue, I would echo what Vincent has just said. I mean, the UN was created as a universal organization as the only global body. Um, dialogue is particularly important in times of crisis. And there are many historic examples, including in my field, the disarmament field, of breakthroughs happening at moments of immense tension between big powers, military powers. So if we start seeing the erosion of such mechanisms to uphold that dialogue, that is something that worries me immensely. So I think preserving those institutions, preserving those avenues becomes more important, more critical when we face these challenges, not less so. So those would be my two points. Thank you. And I also want to build off this comment on the, you know, how can we better include people in direct democracy and in, in direct policy making processes? And I think we're seeing technology has been quite effective and quite helpful in this, particularly when it comes to young people. Uh, you know, before it was definitely those who were in the room could have a say, so everyone who was able to make it to the actual space, and quite often that wasn't young people. You know, we weren't the ones invited or included in the spaces. And what has been happening, you know, Marvin alluded to this with all the consultations he did across the country. We were also doing this across Europe, you know, is that we're able to have the virtual consultations, we're able to use social media to ask the opinion of young people and make sure their opinions are then coming into spaces where it's presented by a young person, or perhaps not, but their opinion is getting into the decision making space. So I think this is really been a, an area to allow for direct democracy for young people to be included uh, much more than it has been in the past. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. But is it a lot better? Absolutely. I think to pick up the last question and to also uh, answer, I think, the toughest question of them all, uh, the first one, um, I'd like to 
say instead of with saying and it's it's good to not wear a hat today because uh, then you don't uh, have to have any kind of um, or you don't have to be uh, this sensible with everything that you say and so first of all Russia is leading an unjustified for aggression against Ukraine and I think we, are, we, we all accept that but the big question now coming in with radical parties is uh, what is peace and how much is peace worth and I think um, we all have to realize that there is no country which wants peace more than Ukraine. And we all have to realize um, the conditions of this peace and the conditions of this peace which are on the table right now. There are no simple solutions and unfortunately this is what uh, populist parties have always been really good at using um, for steering the, the, the popular vote in their opinion. But especially looking at these countries, it is just extremely important to think that, uh, to, to realize who the aggressor is and who the victim is. Um, and beyond that, um, I've been alluding to uh, the reform of the veto, the veto uh, in the Security Council, and there are reform processes going on. Uh, it is by no means easy. I will not say that I um, know this process well enough to say if it's even, even possible to just kick out a member of the Security Council from them. I do not think so. Uh, but what is of course happening is, is that the United Nations system is um, finding ways to deal with this. And so um, if the veto is used now, uh, the General Assembly is going to deal with exactly the matters that the Security Council has not been uh, able to find uh, common ground on. So um, the United Nations system, whilst obviously um, having uh, been the greatest at bringing everyone to the table, um, has also been dealing with uh, a, a party like Russia and um, obscuring um, a lot of these uh, dialogue efforts. And um, I think this is exactly what I wanted to say with staying vigilant. Uh, I think searching uh, the simple solutions, especially uh, for searching peace, is unfortunately in our field and in what we try to achieve um, not the right, right thing to do. Thank you. A lot of communication was shifted to social media. As I already mentioned, these platforms, Telegram for example, WhatsApp, and I think it, there, is, there lies a danger in it of course, because of course on platforms like these people can easily radicalize. So what we do is for example, and uh, with the thought of the city, um, Emma Sitzen, for example, for integration in Vienna is to bring programs that include the diaspora people to bring up, we are just about to bring this up, dialogue, also to, to try to build connections with the youth and the country where the parents come from, the language, through information about the land, nature, the environment and uh, trying to build up positive uh, images about this country of heritage and not only war, conflict, catastrophe. And I think the media has become more diverse, definitely, which is very positive. There are also good new projects that help to finance media projects which is very difficult, I must say. And yeah, so the internet helps immensely. And to the question of the gentleman, of course, this is a field of politics. And I think also here the European Union showed that measures have been taken that can be very effective through tax, for example. Um, is, it is an indirect way, but um, it will hurt a country that get uh, resources through ways that cannot be uh, identified at the end and uh, the evidences are here, it's not a possibility to prosecute. So taxes, for example, is a good way, I think, because this hurts, uh, ex ex exactly, uh, um, 
where to, where to, uh, but what it is about, um, money and resources. Yeah? So it is a, it is a tool. All have to ask us uh, what is peace? Why is it misused? Um, and I think for that it's also, as I said in my speech, really important to not always talk about peace because we can always paint this image like Marvin said, running on a green meadow and looking at a rainbow. It's always a great image for peace, but that's not peace. So we have to talk a bit, little bit less and just just feel more and express more and do more what we think peace is and just show the world what peace is. Thank you. Uh, as the last talk, I would just say we need to continue uh, to empower young people and not just empower them, but invest in them um, for a sustainable and just future. This has been very short and sweet. I'll try to be also short and sweet. Uh, I mean, I would, I would underline the, the word that was in the title of your event today, cultivating uh, a culture of peace, and underline cultivate, cultivate you know, you know, implies an effort, an ongoing sustained investment and effort, uh, and I think that that's really key. So it's not just about marketing, of course, one day a year as a special, uh, special opportunity, but really the steps that we take individually um, through our, our work, through our engagement, through how we engage with each other in our daily lives that, that really is what, what, what affects change over time. So I think cultivating that culture in our daily lives um, as we as we go through through our, our um, you know our, our, as we go our individual ways is very, very key. And I would certainly echo what Christy has just said um, from our perspective, um, making sure that young people have the space also in Formal processes that uh, um, that address issues of peace and security is is key, and so certainly um, investing and continuing to create those those spaces um, will remain a priority for our office, uh, and and one that uh, I have to say is also the most motivating and wonderful part of my daily job, the work that we do with young people, um, uh, and and with you. So thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, also, a big, big thank you for your side. Um, I think this debate um, is absolutely necessary, and I'd love, that's why I was also posing the uh, question and the invitation to join me for the module of the future. We have that much power, that much energy behind also um, our, our work here. And this, of course, means that we've got to ask ourselves the tough questions. Is peace uh, always worth giving up everything uh, for it? Um, or the tough question, what really is peace? And I think this is um, a debate which is extremely um, timely. Uh, and unfortunately, it, uh, on, it seems to get more and more timely and every time we speak on it. But it's, it's, uh, it's simply the case that um, we have an enormous privilege sitting here today and thinking of a day um, and thinking about peace. But others don't have it. So thanks also for the allusion, uh, uh, for the for, for mentioning um, the, the countless crises which have not been voiced today. And um, I think um, this should be at, at the center uh, of our of our work. And I think we need to do way more. And um, with also the toughest of um, uh, formats of tackling, with diplomacy, with talking, and um, with making sure that there is consensus. Um, and all of this needs a lot of uh, time and energy, but this is why the United Nations system prevails, and this is why the United Nations system in the end delivers for young people and for all of us, because uh, it is way more about getting there uh, in the end and making sure that these things have lost and lasting um, positive consequences. Thank you. My final words is a final little story, very little story. I was walking through the Gärtnerstrasse a month ago and I heard a very, very beautiful uh, uh, male voice, a baritone voice, singing opera. I turned back and go to the young guy wearing a white skirt. 
hey, I'm John Herzog, I'm the beautiful voice, who are you? Would you like to come to a rehearsal? Yes, of course, but I'm so sorry, I'm from Russia. I was speechless. And then there came a hack, and I worked with Kirill. And my vision is to have a young journalist to write this story down and to give some missions for the future. Thank you. So, <laughs> Say something. Yes, you really want to have the final word? Certain mistakes wouldn't be made, and I don't know if there are programs, you have programs that bring to, to bring to the schools, yeah? Uh, sure, if, uh, if you would like, there are a variety of different programs on the SDGs for young people and with young people. Uh, I know Eunice, the service here in Vienna, who works with the office, they do a variety of tours for schools, I think there's literally thousands of young people and children who come to the gates every year. Uh, I believe it's integrated into many curriculums across the world, so not just here in Austria, but globally. I can speak for Canada, for example, that's where I'm from. My mom is a teacher and she had a module on the sustainable development goals in the curriculum for elementary school students. So I know that there are, there's vast amount of teaching both at elementary, secondary, and tertiary levels uh, looking uh, towards the SDGs, the sustainable development goals, and how they can be implemented. Uh, what we can do, and I think this is something that's more broad, is when it comes to peace building and, and building peace, I think it also comes down to the individual level of being able to identify emotions, being able to process, and being able to articulate how you're feeling, how to you know eliminate uh, school uh, you know bullying and uh, you know conflict at a school level, and then I think that also Perforates into the global system as well. But there's a variety of information. I'm happy to have a bilateral with you and talk a bit more. But uh, we have a, a lot of information online. If you're interested, please go to the unovc.org slash youth, and there's a variety of uh, online events. And I think that Rebecca also, you have things regarding uh, education.com as well. Yeah. We do indeed also with connection to SDGs and globally UN, as, as Christine was saying, and beyond our two departments, which have a specific at the information service, the global communication team, the office of global communications. There's a global program called UN Impact that's doing exactly what you described, trying to get, get uh, um, SDGs into school curricula, working with academic institutions, working with teachers. Um, we do that a bit uh, you know, locally, some of our institutions based here in Vienna, but there are a lot of initiatives to do it. So thank you very much. I think we have, sorry, I, I realize there are still a few questions, but we have to conclude our meeting. I want to thank you all for being such a good and patient audience. I want to thank all our speakers. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> I want to thank you in the name of the NGO Committee on Peace and everyone who contributed also from our organization. We will inform you about uh, future conferences, meetings, which are public, and uh, because we have your email address, because you had to register, so we have your email address. <laughs> That's the good thing about the UN system. <laughs> so, uh, the uh, we hope that we can create other uh, interesting uh, sessions, conferences, meetings, and I wish you a very pleasant and refreshing day of peace tomorrow. We are ahead of time, that's a good thing. And so please try to find some event where you can participate or some good message which you can hear tomorrow because it's always good to be with people who work.